Let's just open with prayer. Heavenly Father, without you we can do nothing. And so we commit this meeting again to you with all the technology, everything that must be said, and also enlighten everyone to understand where we are in the stream of time. And thank you that we can call you our Savior. In Jesus' name, Amen. I don't know about you, but I like God. And I, I mean that sincerely, I really like Him. I think He has the most beautiful character that the universe has ever seen. His character is so beautiful that if you are filled with sin in your life, you would die if you had to see Him. That's what it means to see the face of God. Jesus Christ, true God and true man is present wholly and entirely in his body, his blood, under the sign of bread and wine. Could you, with a clear conscience, sign such a document? I hope, certainly not. This common statement affirms all the essential elements of faith in the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ without adopting the conceptual terminology transubstantiation. How clever, spoken like the serpent, that's me, it's not in the document. <laughs> so we believe it's transubstantiation, but because the word irritates you, we'll drop it. That's what they said. And the Lutherans said, that's fine. Now, this is not to knock the Lutherans. My mother was Lutheran. It was the most logical thing for me under the sun to have become a Lutheran. I'm a Luther fanatic. I'm more Lutheran than any Lutheran on the planet. I don't know what their problem is that they can go along with such a thing. And because the denomination goes along with it, all I can say to my Lutheran friends is if this goes through and if this happens, come out of her, my people. What else do you want? They go further, then they start speaking about the adoration of Christ present in the sacrament. Now it gets scary. Because in Catholicism, because it is the literal body of Christ, you can worship it, you can adore it. Okay. Wouldn't you rather adore the real thing? So to the question of the real presence comes the question of adoration of Christ. And the, it's, they say it's a question of time. You see, Martin Luther originally had the idea of consubstantiation, whereas Catholics teach transubstantiation. It becomes the literal body and blood, etc. We'll look at the two concepts just now, but we need to understand them. But now, if it is the real presence, then, well, then it, it is really Christ present there. You can adore it. You can bow down before it. And then they say Catholic and Lutheran Christians together confess that the Eucharistic presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is directed towards believing reception. That it nevertheless is not confined only to the moment of reception and that it does not depend on the faith of the receiver. Excuse me. Martin Luther said that the sacraments mean nothing if they are not linked with faith. Catholicism teaches that the mere doing of the ritual has sacramental, that means salvation, aspects attached to it. Martin Luther said, you're not going to be saved because you eat a piece of bread. Excuse me. You must be saved because you see this as, the sacrifice, as a reminder of the sacrifice that was brought to you. If you don't add faith to it, it's not going to be of any value. But he did have a wrong concept of consubstantiation early, where he said, well, it's divinely mingled. It doesn't stay God. It becomes bread. And so now here they're arguing about how long does it stay God? How long? Long enough that you can adore it because it's God? Nevertheless, it's not confined only to the moment of reception. The Lutherans agree. Okay, it remains God a little while. This is pathetic. 
excuse me, and that it does not depend on the faith of the receiver. That's totally negating what Martin Luther taught. And I asked the question, did you sign this? Did you sign that you can adore the, the Eucharist as a consequence? Article 157 makes it quite clear that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. That's why Roman Catholics Leaders are not called pastors, they're called priests, because a priest brings a sacrifice. And that is why a Roman Catholic church is not a church, it's a temple, because it has an altar for sacrifice. We'll come into that in a moment. So they, be, they agree that it is a sacrifice, but they continue to say, the sacrifice can neither be continued, nor repeated, nor replaced, nor complemented, but rather it can and should become ever effective in you in the midst of the congregation. So it becomes effective in you. You sacrifice again and again. This is pure Roman Catholic doctrine. There are different interpretations amongst us regarding the nature and extent of this effectiveness. So they capitulate on the sacrifice. And let's just make sure, let's go to uh, Christian Korea. What are transubstantiation and consubstantiation? This is not an Adventist source. This is what Protestants believe. So what's the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation? The word transubstantiation derives from the Latin trans, across, substantia, substance. The term is employed in Roman Catholic theology to denote the idea that during the ceremony of the Mass, the bread and wine are changed in substance into the flesh and body of Christ, to which the Lutherans just agreed, right? Even though the elements appear to remain the same, the doctrine has no basis in Scripture, so say these Protestants, there are traces of the dogma in some of the post-apostolic writings, etc. It was formalized at the Council of Trent. Then, what is consubstantiation? It's a term called, commonly applied to the Lutheran concept of the communion supper. I would like to correct that to the early Lutheran idea. Though some modern Lutherans reject the use of this term because of its ambiguity. The expression, however, is generally associated with Luther, which is correct. The idea is that in communion, the body and blood of Christ and the bread and wine coexist in union with each other. Luther illustrated by the analogy of the iron put in the fire, whereby both fire and iron are united in the red-hot iron, and yet each continues unchanged. That's the Oxford Dictionary of Christian Church. Fine. So Luther had elements of Catholicism in his thinking, and the Reformers or argued with him and said, no, it's just a symbol. But Luther grew up as a Catholic priest, dedicated to the sacrifice of the Mass, and he broke very with great difficulty from this concept. But that doesn't mean that he didn't break with the concept. Is that correct? So these sneaky guys, excuse me, quote him in his early writings. They dare not quote him in his later writings. This is the book Table Talk. Who's read it? Okay, who's not read it? <laughs> I suggest every single one of you gets the book Table Talk and reads it forthwith. And who knows the history of the book Table Talk? Don't all shout at once. <laughs> all right. Let me tell you the history. I'm going to take a moment because really it's worthwhile. It's really worthwhile to tell the history. Table Talk is a compilation of everything that Martin Luther said around the table of chatting to his colleagues and to his students. And they feverishly, his colleagues and his students, wrote it down. And then his great, great friend von Amstorf, one of the Lutheran theologians, where Martin Luther said, I find such peace in my friend uh, von Amstorf, my dear friend, collated it later and put it in a book form. Now when Martin Luther wrote, you know, publicly, he was fiery. But when he spoke, around the table, he was a bombshell. He called a spade a shovel. 
And the book did so much damage to Roman Catholicism that Roman Catholicism banned the book and sentenced to death anyone who had the book. They went from house to house, tore the people outside when they had the book and had them executed. It became so serious that they later issued a decree that if you had the book and you handed it in, your life would be spared. And so they collected all the books and they burnt them all. Now the book was of course in German and the book was also translated into High Dutch because the Dutch were Protestants and the Dutch fled to southern Africa, that's where uh, they went and settled, those who escaped this great Alva Spanish war, persecution, massacre of the Protestants. That's another story. I mustn't get off my track. And so, eventually, it was believed that the book had disappeared completely. And I'm not 100% sure, I think it was about 100 and something years, maybe even 150 years, after the event that somebody was building a building and they tore down an old structure and in the foundation, wrapped in wax and dipped in wax, they found this high Dutch copy of Table Talk. And there was a, a visitor from the King's Court of England who happened to be fluent in high Dutch. And the, the people were so excited but they were so afraid to make this public or that it be known because then they might still be persecuted or even killed for having this book in their possession. This is what it was like. And so they gave it to this man and asked him whether he could translate it. And he went back to England and he worked at the king's court. He was one of the king's advisors. And one night he had a dream because he just didn't get round to translating it. He had a dream of a, a man dressed in white, an old man dressed in white, telling him, you must translate that book. And he got such a fright, he, had, he decided to do it immediately, but then, you know, life gets busy and he forgot. And he had a second dream, just a short while later, which said to him, I will give you time to translate the book. And he got a big fright, and he thought, what was he going to do about it? And while he was still thinking about it, people from the king's court came and arrested him without charge and threw him in jail where he sat for the next seven years. And there in the jail, he translated the book into English, meticulously, very carefully. And... About five or so years later, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had by then already been swayed slightly towards Catholicism and was flirting secretly with Catholicism, asked whether he could see the book and take the book. And after much, much discussion and many promises because he didn't trust him, he submitted to this request and the Archbishop never returned the book. And so eventually, he wrote the Archbishop and said, if you do not return the book, I will complain to Parliament. Now, Parliament was Protestant, remember? Totally Protestant. And he got a fright and returned the book. And then the King got to hear about it through these circumstances. And Parliament got to hear about it through these circumstances. By the way, Parliament eventually had that Archbishop of Canterbury executed for treason or whatever. He obviously went the other way. And Parliament got hold of the book. And this is what Parliament then eventually did. This is Henry Bell's testimony regarding the House of Commons decision to print table talk. Let's change the options here. This is Henry Bell's testimony regarding the House of Commons decision to print table talk in English. Whereupon they made report, dated the 10th of November 1646, 
that they found it to be an excellent divine work worthy of the light and publishing, especially in regard, listen carefully, that Luther in the said discourses did revoke his opinion which he formerly held touching consubstantiation. In the sacrament, whereupon the House of Commons on the 24th of February, 1646, did give order for the printing thereof, given under my hand the third day of July, 1650, Henry Bell. There you go. So the British Parliament decided this book needs to be published. Now, let us go to Martin Luther and see what he said about what the Lutherans are now doing. Number one, they're saying that the host literally becomes the body and the blood. And they're saying, well, you know, we can argue about how long it stays the body and the blood, but it can be venerated. Excuse me. Now, when the papacy lifts up the host, it's for veneration. Let's see what Martin Luther said. He said, even so, we must let the words of Christ remain and speak of the sacrament in Swiss terminus in their terms with such words as Christ used and spake, as do this must not be turned into offer this. So he revoked the idea that it was a sacrament and an offer like a sacrifice. He revoked it. What signifies it to dispute and wrangle about the abominable idolatry of elevating the sacrament on high to show it to the people. So what did he say about venerating it? Abominable idolatry, which has no approbation with the fathers and was introduced only to confirm the errors touching the worship thereof, as though bread and wine lost their substance and retained only their form and smell and taste. And thus the pap this the papists called transubstantiation and darkened the right use of the sacrament Whereas even in Popedom at Milan, from Ambrose's time to the present day, they never held or observed in the Mass either canon or elevation of the Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. So Martin Luther clearly did not believe what the document says he believed. Clearly. So this is what he was talking about. There is the altar. This is the, the way in which the Mass is celebrated. And if you look at a Catholic altar, there are mostly steps leading up to it. It's elevated, and it is built of marble or some special structure, and there's always a part of a corpse in it, because you cannot say a mass unless there's a relic of a dead saint or person therein. In Exodus 20, 26, it says, Neither shall they go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness might not be discovered thereon. There were to be no steps. It says, Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord. A people that provoketh me to anger continually, Isaiah 65 verse 3, to my face that sacrificeth in gardens and burned incense on, upon altars of brick. So it was never to be built out of hewn stones of any kind. It had to be like this. Raw stones, it was just a place for the offering, and there were no steps allowed leading up to it. This is an abomination altar because it's built from hewn stones. Of course, the stones stand for the character of God, and you cannot chisel away at the character of Christ. He's perfect. You leave the stone as it is. When it came to stones that were built into the temple, different story. They were hewn in a quarry outside, and when they were perfect, they were built into the temple. And the Bible says, you are the living stones that are built into the temple, and in this quarry of life, you will be chiseled and hammered so that your character can be conformed and fit into the temple of God. This is the theology of why it had to be unhewn stones. And Martin Luther called what the Pope is doing here an abominable idolatry. That's what he called it. And yet, the Lutheran Church in the document does the same thing. Now, we know that associated with the Lord's Supper, you have the foot washing ceremony, which none of the churches really do. 
But I've seen posters like this even in our magazines of the Pope washing feet and praising his great humility. I want to tell you today that this is an abomination and I'll tell you why. Here is Pope Francis washing the feet of sick people and poor people. John 13 verse 13, you call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am, said Jesus. If I then your Lord and master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Why is what the Pope is doing an abomination? They don't wash his feet. He is taking the place of Jesus Christ. So what would you do if your pastor comes to you and says, I'm feeling very holy today and I'm going to wash all your feet. But he doesn't have his feet washed. Run! Article 174, within this framework, the council developed the notion of the priesthood of the baptized and addressed its relationship to the ministerial priesthood. In Catholic theology, the ordained minister is sacramentally empowered to act in the name of Christ as well as in the name of the church. So this is a sacrament. Now in Catholic thinking, this is altogether necessary for salvation. The mere ritual saves you. Whereas in Protestantism, a ritual can never save you. It is only the living Christ who can save you. Catholic theology is convinced that the office of bishop makes an indispensable contribution to the unity of the church. So now there's a dispute between the two. Article 174, in Catholic theology... The ordained minister is sacramentally empowered to act in the name of Christ as well as in the name of the church. So he becomes an altar Christos. He becomes like a God who turns the bread into the body and blood of Christ. In fact, in their writings they say it is more than creating the world because you're creating God. Catholic theology is convinced that the office of bishop makes an indispensable contribution, okay? So you have to be special therein. Luther's particular doctrine of the common priesthood did not adequately maintain the church's hierarchical structure. Now, let's see what they say on this issue. Lutherans and Catholics also agree on the responsibility of ordained leadership for the administration of the sacraments, okay? But the question is now, are they pastors or are they priests? Because if you bring a sacrament, if you bring a sacrifice, you're a priest. That's what they were in the Old Testament. But if you are just pastoral, they're not. I've left out quite a few verses which will be on the original DVDs, but just for the sake of time, I'm summing it up slightly. Now, Lutherans say... The gospel bestows on those who preside over the churches the commission to proclaim the gospel, forgive sins, and administer the sacraments. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. What about you? Since when do Lutherans proclaim the gospel? I have no problem with that. Since when do they forgive sins? Since when? and the administration of the sacraments. Administer the sacraments which they consider to be bound up with the Eucharist. So this is total capitulation of Protestant theology and a total acceptance of Roman theology. Who's changed? Rome or the Protestants here? Protestants have changed. Though the ministration was to be removed from earthly to the heavenly temple, says the desire of ages, though the sanctuary and our great high priest would be invisible to human sight, yet the disciples were to suffer no loss thereby. They would realize no break in their communion, no diminution of power because of the Savior's absence. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit the minister of the church on earth. 
So I don't need an intermediary priest to take the role that Jesus would take because Jesus is gone. What kind of doctrine is that? The Jesus that I serve is alive and through his spirit, as it is said here, ministers to each individual's personal needs as they come to him in prayer and ask him for forgiveness. I don't need an intermediary. And he certainly doesn't have to be a Catholic priest and even less a Lutheran priest. If a Lutheran priest should come to me, or excuse me, maybe he's still pastor, should come and say, would you want your sins forgiven? I think I would have an apoplectic. (laughs) And of course the Bible says, uh, there's one offering, one sacrifice for sins, and he forever sat down on the right hand of God. So this whole question of hierarchy, I'll just briefly run through it. Catholics say there's a priest and there is a, an office of hierarchy, cardinals, and that this ensures unity of the church. So you have a pope and you have a college of cardinals. Lutherans are defective in this way because they haven't got this, so they must come back into the theology of the church. Now where did all of this stuff come from? When did it change from servants to rulers? And when did it change from ministers to priests? When did this happen? Well, Ignatius of Antioch was the first one. In his letter, we encounter for the first time the ecclesiology which exalts one bishop over the rest of the presbytery. So with him came the first bit of apostasy. So you have one man who becomes the voice for many. Then Irenaeus came. And he introduced virtual infallibility. So this is not in the Gospels. It's not in the Bible. And uh, he also developed the basis for Catholic Marian theology. And the next one was Tertullian developed clarification. That is the distinction between clergy and laity. And this is very important. Acts 15 verse 23. This is the King James Version. And they, the apostles... They'd come together for this council of Jerusalem and they were going to make decisions regarding food sacrifice to idols and circumcision and other Jewish rites, how they affect Christians, and they came together. And this is what the King James said. They wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. That's the King James Version. So who sat down in the council and wrote this letter? The apostles and the elders and the brethren. And they sent greetings unto the brethren. So what kind of meeting was that? That was a GC meeting. Yes, because at a GC, it is the the leaders together with the laity, that make a decision regarding a doctrine. It's not the leaders alone who do that. You do that in a synod, and it's not one man, a pope, who does it. It's all of them together. But they don't like that. They want to be the ones who decide for you to elevate themselves to this elevated position and then to decide for you. That's why in Protestant churches you have a synod, And they decide, and the church listens. In papacy, you have a pope, he decides, and the church listens. But not in God's church. It's the apostles, the elders, and the brethren that make the decision. So the NIV changes it it to, with them, they sent the following letters. The apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, to the Gentile believers, etc., etc. So here you have a hierarchy. So that sets the clergy apart from the laity. No pastor, no pastor is above the weakest of the saints. No pastor has greater value with God than the weakest of the saints. So this is a total misplacement of of this hierarchical structure. Then Cyprian elevates clerics to priests. So this was a a development over time. He claimed that the bishop is a sacrificing priest. This is taking it back to Old Testament theology. You can't do that. The next article says, 
uh, the Bishop of Rome, by virtue of his office, is pastor of the whole church. Didn't Martin Luther reject that? And 188, the Second Vatican Council reaffirmed its understanding that bishops have by divine institution taken the place of the apostles. Excuse me, where does that say that in the Bible? As pastors of the church in such wise that where, whoever hears them hears Christ and whoever rejects them rejects Christ and him who sent Christ. So now you have this hierarchy where you have this God-man telling you what you must believe and you must come to him to find sacraments so that you can be saved. This is total Catholic idolatry and it's in a joint document. Fullness of the sacramental sign. For Catholics, Lutheran ordinations lack the fullness of the sacramental sign. You see, if you're detached from the Roman Catholic Church and the power is derived through the Pope and through the cardinals and the bishops, which the church calls the magisterium, well, then you can't be an alter Christos. So according to them, the Lutherans, when they come back into church, they must be ordained through this process, and then they will have the right structure. Therefore, it is also Catholic doctrine that in Lutheran churches, the sacramental sign of ordination is not fully present because those who ordain do not act in connection with the Catholic Episcopal College, just what I explained. Therefore, the Second Vatican Council speaks of defectus sacramenti ordinus. These are defective churches. And they're quite happy to join the Roman Catholic Church, even though it says in this, min, in this aspect, you are defective. Unbelievable. Finally, 192, for Catholics, the Roman Pontiff has full supreme universal power over the church. The College of Bishops also exercises supreme and full power over the universal church, together with the head, the Roman Pontiff, and never without this head. They make it quite clear. Quite clear. And then they continue in 194, in the course of history, the Lutheran ministerial office has been able to fulfill its task in keeping the church and the truth because we're still ready, basically, to fuse together. So you must still have some aspects that are real. They're so condescending. How nice of you. If according to the judgment of the Second Vatican Council, the Holy Spirit uses ecclesiastical communities, as means of salvation, it could seem that this work of the Spirit would have implications for some mutual recognition of ministry. Aren't they sweet? How condescending. <laughs> Scripture and tradition. Did this lead to a split? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Well, Lutherans, what have you signed here? Let's see. Luther's understanding of Scripture, its interpretation in human tradition, the controversy broke out, etc. Let's just read the highlight. The papal court theologian, Sylvester so-and-so, argued in his first answer to Luther's thesis on indulgences, whoever does not hold to the teaching of the Roman Church and the Pope as an infallible rule of faith, from which the Holy Scripture also derives its power and authority, he is a heretic. And John Eck replied to Luther, the scripture is not authentic without the authority of the church. So that was the position of the church. And the Lutherans said, never at that stage. When Vatican II speaks of the church having an ultimate judgment, it clearly eschews a monopolistic claim, etc. So what do they finally decide on this issue? Thus, this is a joint document. Lutherans and Catholics are able jointly to conclude, therefore regarding scripture and tradition, Lutherans and Catholics are in such an extensive agreement that their different emphasis do not of themselves require maintaining the present division of the churches. In this area there is unity in reconciled diversity. What's that? So what have, who's capitulated on the issue? Rome or the Lutherans? Can you see that this is one capitulation after the other? They've capitulated on grace. They have, and justification. They've capitulated on the mass. They've capitulated on idolizing the host. They've capitulated on the priesthood. 
They have capitulated on the church. They have capitulated on the position of the Pope. And uh, now they capitulate on tradition. And they sacrifice the word for consensual unity. That's unbelievable. The teaching of the Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium is essential to the Catholic understanding of the church. The council fathers explained the role of the church within salvation history in terms of sacramentality. You see, Rome teaches there's no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. But if you affiliate yourself and you accept the position of leadership of the papacy, then this grace flows through even to you. Isn't that kind? This is why I was told as a little child by the Roman Catholic nun that gave me religious instruction that my mother was going to roast in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever because she was a Lutheran, because she was outside of this grace. That's why I became an atheist and tore up the catechism and threw it at the nun and was thrashed forever after. So this makes the Roman church altogether necessary for salvation. Yes or no? Okay. Towards consensus. 216. In the Lutheran Roman Catholic conversation, a clear consensus has emerged that the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of the church belong together. Uh. So Christ can't do anything for you without the approval of the Pope. That's what they're signing. That's what they're signing. Unbelievable. Since Catholic and Lutherans are bound to one another in the body of Christ as members of it, then it is true of them what Paul says, if one member suffers, all suffer, etc. For this reason, when Lutheran Christians remember the events that led to the particular formation of their churches, they do not wish to do so without their fellow Catholic Christians. So we're going to be one again. Because they believe that they belong to the one body of Christ, Lutherans emphasize that their church did not originate with the Reformation or come into existence only 500 years ago. Excuse me, what's that history about? You see, Rome has always maintained that the Reformation churches are not churches. They are rebellious children. And the rebellion is over. They're coming back home. Therefore, they're claiming the Lutherans agree we never really were a church. This is what it says here. They belong to the one body of Christ. Lutherans emphasize that the church did not originate with the Reformation or come into existence 500 years ago. Why? Their argument is very subtle. Because the Reformers had no desire to found a new church. True. Martin Luther had no intention of starting a new church. He wanted to reform his. But when he discovered the prophecies of Daniel and he saw that the church was untransformable, untr what did he do? He called the Pope Antichrist and he split. That's what he did. And he became a Protestant church. They're ignoring that history totally. They agree they wanted to reform the church and they managed to do so within their field of influence. Listen to this now albeit with errors and missteps. So the reformers were the dumb ones. Catholics are great. And I'm asking the questions. Excuse me, did you sign this? Was there even a Lutheran theologians or was it Jesuit Luther Lutheran theologians that signed this thing? A member of one body, Catholics and Lutherans remember together the events of the Reformation, etc., and they're going to worry about the pain and lament it in 2017. No one who is theologically responsible can celebrate the division of Christians from one another. So in the year 2007, they're going to celebrate it unitedly as one. That's what they're saying. Reason to regret and lament. Article 229. On this occasion, Lutherans will also remember the vicious and degrading statements that Martin Luther made against the Jews. They are ashamed of them and deeply deplore them. Lutherans have come to recognize with a deep sense of regret the persecution of the Anabaptists, 
Lutheran authorities and the fact that Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon theologically supported this persecution. They deplore Luther's violent attacks against the peasants during the peasant war. I thought I was going to have a heart attack again, but I had too many already, so I decided not to have one. This is a total distortion of history. Martin Luther tried to prevent the peasant war at every cost. And yes, the Anabaptists had theological aspects that were right, but they were hooping and howling and rolling and carrying on with all kinds of activities that these people had abhorred and uh, it led to, well, altercations. The awareness of the dark side of Luther and the Reformation. Lutherans today reject Luther's identification of the Pope with the Antichrist. All in this document. Now I'm surprised that the Pope, the present one, actually apologized to the Valdensians. This is unbelievable. What a master strategist this man is. Because he must have heard me say, so Luther's sins are brought to the fore and trampled upon, but you who murdered the Valdensians and murdered the Albigenses and smashed their children's heads against the rocks, you are not to blame at all. And so the Pope apologized to the Valdensius. And he did it quite well. Uh, Pope Francis, earlier today, became the first pontiff in history to visit the Valdensius Evangelical Church when he attended the Valdensian Temple and he, and he said to them uh, that he's sorry for the terrible things they did to the Valdensius. That's a masterstroke. Masterstroke. But they're already in the ecumenical movement so it's quite safe to do so. Here's the other Catholic confession of sins. In 1522, Pope Hadrian complained of abuses and trespasses, sins and errors, insofar as church authorities had committed them. And then he apologized to the divided brethren in the East. There was no apology to the reformers that were slaughtered by their millions, by the Inquisition. And then they talk about Pope John Paul II similarly acknowledged guilt and offered prayers for forgiveness as part of the observance of the 2000th Holy Year. He didn't specify any deeds whatsoever and it was in the same tone as insofar as church authorities had committed them. Now if I have a serious argument with my wife and I'm, I'm terribly guilty but I'm stubborn as a goat and I can't stand the, the, the icy cold atmosphere any longer, I will go to her and say, insofar as I have erred, I'm sorry. <laughs> She'll run to me and say, what a wonderful apology. Thank you, dear. I'll probably get clobbered, right? It's pathetic, really. And Paul VI and the Council Fathers regarding the painful memories, but actually to do something about it, he also related the request of forgiveness of the office of the Bishop of Rome. Martin Luther gets trampled and this is all they do. This is not a confession at all. At the Fifth Assembly in Evian 1970, the Lutheran World Federation declared in response to the deeply moving presentation by Jan Cardinal Wildebrandt that, this is in the document, 236, we as Lutheran Christians, listen carefully now, and congregations are prepared to acknowledge that the judgment of the reformers upon the Roman Catholic Church and its theology was not entirely free of polemical distortions, which in part have been perpetuated to the present day. We are truly sorry for the offense and misunderstanding which these polemic elements have caused our Roman Catholic brethren. We remember with gratitude what Pope Paul says, forgiveness for any offense caused by the Roman Catholic Church. Exactly the same apology. If we offended, then please forgive us. What about, hello, sorry we smashed you, burnt you, murdered you, killed your children, ripped up your, your wombs and tore the babies out while you were still alive. Sorry we did that. That would be kind of nice, wouldn't it? So what is this? What's on the board there? It's a public apology for the Reformation. That's what it is. A public apology for the Reformation. 
the awareness is dawning on Lutherans and Catholics that the struggle of the 16th century is over. The reason for mutually condemning each other's faith have fallen by the wayside. Every single doctrinal point they capitulated. Now my mother was Lutheran. The whole of Germany was at a stage almost Lutheran until the Catholics took it back, a large portion of it. But I would like to say to my Lutheran brethren, don't sell Christ so cheap. Is it really over? Ten manuscripts release. We are to give the message Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen and has become a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and, every, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her. This message is to come to the churches. We are to consider the best plans for accomplishing this. This message, the message must be so presented as to command the attention of reasoning minds. We just went through their entire document, hopefully reasoning from cause to effect. Where were you? Where are you now? This message must come to the churches. Our warfare is aggressive. Tremendous issues are before us and right upon us that our prayers ascend to God for the four angels may hold the four winds that they may not blow up to injure or destroy until the last warning has been given. Then let us work in harmony with our prayers. Let nothing lessen the force for the truth of this time. The present truth is our burden. The third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people who will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. This is the loud cry. This is what we are witnessing. The first call and the second call. Let's just take a moment to consider what we are doing here. Because if you preach this message, you will be criticized from all quarters. We must know where we stand and what our duty as Seventh-day Adventists is. First call of Babylon and the final call. Two calls out of Babylon. Two temple cleansings. This is me writing now. Two calls to Abraham. The first call out of Ur was just a partial coming out because he got stuck in Haran. Remember that? where his father still worshipped foreign gods. That's typology. That's the typology. When that generation died, the second call out of Haran resulted in a complete separation from idolatry. So there were two calls. According to Asha, well, we don't have to go into the details as to when the call was. Now let's have a look at this. The midnight cry empowered the second angel's message. I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun. And I heard the voices of the angels say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. That was the midnight cry. This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. So the midnight cry, that first cry that went out, was to give power to to the second angel's message, which was Babylon has fallen, has fallen, because she has drunk of the wine of Babylon. So the loud cry it will be the second call, and it will also empower the second angel's message. Let's make sure. Great controversy. Of Babylon at the time brought to view in this prophecy, it is declared her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. She has filled up the measure of her guilt, and destruction is about to fall on her. But God still has a people in Babylon. And before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Hence the movement, symbolized by the second angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth. No. Since the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. What did we just do? Didn't we just announce their doctrinal changes? In connection with the message, the call is heard, come out of her, my people. These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. 
And she quotes, Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice to the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory was imparted to the angel. As he descended, the earth was lighted with his glory. The light which attended the angel penetrated everywhere, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, has fallen, become a house of habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul spirit and cage of unclean, hateful bird. So, the message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated, second call, with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. Is it corrupt? What Martin called abominable idolatry to accept it as adequate and normal? Of course it's corrupt. The work of this angel has come in at a time to join the last great work of the third angel's message. I heard those clothed with the armor speak the truth with great power. You know these texts. We don't have to go into great detail. And the straight testimony at the end of time will cause a shaking. And people will say, if you start... Don't stop bringing this message. You are divisive. Yes, let it be divisive. If it's truth, then stand upon it. It'll produce a shaking. Ask the meaning of the shaking. You know these verses. I don't have to read them. There are those among us who will make confession as Achan did, too late to save themselves. The Lord calls for renewal of the straight testimony born in years past. He calls for renewal of spiritual life. This is no time for us to be asleep. We are on the borders of Canaan. I want to do a little typology with you. History is to be repeated. Let's have a look. Matthew chapter 27 verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. He released them Barabbas. And he had Jesus scourged. For what reason? And then when they had plaited a crown of thorns. By the way, this is fascinating. He released Barabbas and when he had scourged him, he delivered him up to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him, put on him a scarlet robe, and when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, they bowed down the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. What did they do? They actually crowned him king. They actually crowned him king. They mocked, yes. But they put a crown on him, and it was a crown of thorns. They put a royal robe on him because he was royal. They put the reed of office into his hand, and then they mocked him. But they actually crowned him king without knowing it. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And you know the story. For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him out of envy. But what did they answer? Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil has he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes him a king speaks against Caesar. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabata. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar.
Shall I crucify your king? What is the sacrament of the mass? What is the sacrament of the mass in Catholic thinking? Identical to the crucifixion. Identical. And what did they sign, the Lutherans? A document which says they agree that it is the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, we will return to your idolatry. We're going to do it jointly. Because we have no king but Caesar. We acknowledge that belong to the church and the church is altogether necessary for salvation. Let's just discuss this a little bit further. Because history is far more exciting than fiction. Let's go and have a look at the history of Caesar. As the power of Rome expanded into many parts of Greece, Attalus, the last king of Pergamos, died in 133 BC, and he left in his will all the dominions of Pergamos to the Roman people. So who were these kings of Pergamos? This was the ancient Babylonian priesthood where the priest was also the God King. It was the King of Babylon. And when the Medo-Persians conquered, this priesthood was allowed to leave. And they left and started the city of Pergamos where the God King of Babylon ruled. Now you must understand the history. He had to be God and he was a king. And he determined all religious activity of Babylon. So, he left his dominions in 133 to the Roman people. Thus the kingdom of Pergamos was merged into the dominions of Rome. However, for some years there was no one who would openly lay claim to all the dignity and powers inherent in the title of the king of Pergamos. You see, he was the Pontifex Maximus, namely that of sovereign pontiff. The powers of the Roman pontiff were therefore somewhat restricted. But this situation changed dramatically with the arrival of Julius Caesar. Because in this will, Attalus had said, if you want to exercise all the power of the king, of Pergamos, the Babylonian god king, you have to be deified. You must become God. You must be the reincarnation of God, Osiris originally, the Greek equivalents later, and the Roman equivalents thereafter. You will be God. And none of the Roman emperors accepted that portion of the power until it came to Julius Caesar. So the powers of the Roman pontiff were somewhat restricted, but this situation changed with the arrival of Julius Caesar. It was from Julius Caesar's name that the Roman emperors took their title Caesar. Caesar also held the position of Pontifex Maximus. Julius Caesar was elected to the position of Pontifex Maximus in 63 BC. He subsequently assumed the position of supreme ruler of the Roman state. Thus he had vested in him all the powers and functions of the Babylonian pontiff and he was the true legitimate successor of Belshazzar. Not satisfied with this, he was declared to be Jupiter's incarnation on the 25th of December, note the date, 48 BC. This is fascinating. So in 48 BC, Caesar was not only Pontifex Maximus, he was God. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, there are signs that in the last six months of his life, he aspired not only to monarchy in name as well as in fact, but also to a divinity which Romans should acknowledge as well as Greeks, Orientals and Barbarians. That's the whole world. Julius Caesar, by laying claim to be divine, followed the pattern of the kings of Pergamos. 
The Roman emperors, thus followed Jusil Caesar, were commonly regarded as gods. Temples were built in their name, and they had to be worshipped. So when they say, we have no king but Caesar, did they choose a god king? Yes. Yes. Now let's look at the Pope. Here is Pope Francis sitting on a great white throne between cherubs with four individuals sitting around him. What does that remind you of? That is the throne room of God as it is described in the visions of the prophets. This is a God king. And the throne of Jesus is described as a great white throne, is it not? And he had four living creatures around him. He has four living creatures around him too here. Or should I not say it quite so harshly? And there he sits on a great white throne. Is this a blasphemy or is this not a blasphemy? This is blasphemy of the highest order. He's taking position of God on this planet. He is the Pontifex Maximus, the God King. That's why he is infallible. That's why he's the one that gives grace. He's the one who releases you from the punishment of your sins. And the grace that he uses is anyone's. Anyone's. But he prefers Mary's and the saints, it seems, to Jesus. So, between two golden cherubims, Isaiah 37, 16. Isn't that incredible? Now, the Bible talks of two beasts. There's the beast out of the sea, and there's the beast out of the earth. Who's the beast out of the earth? The United States of America. All right, let's look at that. And they're in working in harmony. There we have Obama sitting on a great iron throne made of a thousand swords. On his lap, he has a crown. In front of him is a bow, which symbolizes the weapon that the Messiah has. Remember? He uses the bow. So this depicts the military side. Why is he sitting on a great iron throne? Iron is the symbol of what? Rome. And what do the swords symbolize? The swords sim symbolize the nations of the world having capitulated to Rome. And as you can see, there are also three pine cones here. And the pine cones the greatest appearance of pine cones you will find in the Vatican because it is the symbol of Vatican power. So the beast out of the sea sits on a great white throne and his lackey sits on an iron throne of Rome and has subjected all the nations to him. Now, would you agree that to construct such a throne must have cost quite a bit of money. But the White House said that uh, it was just a joke. But people didn't take it as a joke. Critics slam White House for tweeting picture of Obama as king. Michelle Bachman, for example, noted that Obama might think he's a king, but he's not. With Republican Randy Weber sent out a message blasting the president as a socialist dictator. More recently, as Obama steps up his deeply unpopular rule by decree campaign, Senator Ted Cruz compared Obama to the late British tyrant and oppressor of the American colonies, King George III. You know, it's all very interesting stuff. This is symbolizing what is happening in the world. These powers, the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth, will get the whole world to follow um, the beast out of the sea. Now, is it coincidence that Obama, when he accepted the nomination for to be the presidential candidate of the Democratic Party, did his acceptance speech on the backdrop of the 
temple of Pergamos, where the Bible says, Revelation 13 verse 4, people worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast and asked who is like the beast who can wage war against it. And then it says also in Revelation, Pergamos, where Satan has his seat. Can you get any closer than that? They are so blatant, so blatant. The Caesar takes the power of Pergamos, he becomes a god king, and he has to be worshipped and obeyed. And here sits the Pope on a great white throne between the cherubim with four individuals around him emulating the throne room of God and his sidekick sits on an iron throne taking the title of king, which by the way is totally correct because all the presidents come from one family, royal descendants. They're all royal, everyone that has ruled in the United States. And the Bible says, not the elected presidents of the world, but the kings of the world give their power unto the beast. U.S. has globalist strategy to dominate the world. So says Press TV. Now that's the Iranian side, but they're actually quite right. <laughs> but they're not doing it in their behalf, they've been doing it on the behalf of the first beast. Pope Francis is the first pope to visit the United States Congress. He will be speaking in this temple. Please note that the Capitol is not an ordinary building. It is a temple. And on top of it, you have Persiformis. And Persiformis is just the deity who today is transferable into Mary. And she's the one who will be the victor because it also stands in Mary land. And this Mary this Persiformis is facing directly in the direction of Rome, as is the obelisk, which faces directly in the direction of Rome. All presidents were always inaugurated on the other side of the obelisk, but I think it's since Ronald Reagan that they've all been inaugurated facing the obelisk, which means facing Rome. Now the, the blogs will tell you, Pope to address Congress during Blood Moon Tetrad on Day of Atonement. Ooh, this is going to be very exciting. Timing is everything. When major leaders of the world uh, purposefully plan to address other leaders, specific holidays, well, there will be four blood moons and this. Ooh, this is going to be very exciting. You know what? This is all nonsense. This is the occult way of determining when things must happen. They have their little jubilees and their little dates and their little blood moons and their little uh, solstices and their, their paraphernalia. We have the word of God. We are not paraphernalia orientated. We are word orientated. The Bible says the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. The Bible says the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth will work together and they will create legislation which will eventually lead to the persecution of God's people. NBC Washington. The Pope will arrive at Joint Base Andrews September 22nd. The next day we'll meet with President Barack Obama at the White House and celebrate Mass outside the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Do you think that that is uh, just by the way? The Mass outside the Basilica will be in Spanish and will be a ticketed event. He meets with both houses of Congress on the 25th and he addresses, uh, in 25th he addresses the UN. So he meets him on the Day of Atonement. Whether it's of any significance, I really don't care. But this is all preparatory for the great culmination of his inauguration of King of this world, God King, who sets the morality for the planet instead of God, and the whole world is going to accept it. Obama calls for world leaders to heed Pope Francis's message. Catholic Herald, the President of the United States has said he wants to follow world lead, fellow world leaders to reflect on Pope Francis's encyclical, 
yesterday, called for humanity to change its approach to the environment. Barack Obama spoke of the responsibility of his own job title brings in leading the way towards change in global environmental policy. And by the way, linked to that policy, you have Sunday and the Eucharist, which is the total eradication of the authority of Jesus and keeps him perpetually crucified. I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis's encyclical and deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case, clearly, powerfully, and full of moral authority of his position. Isn't that enough already? For action on global climate change, he said, as we prepare for the summit, etc. These are all sideline issues, nonsense issues. Here's his encyclical letter, which the Obama just praised. It is in the Eucharist that all that has been created finds its greatest exaltation. If you read that in an occult way, it says, in the obliteration of Jesus Christ, we find the greatest exaltation. That's exactly what it says. Because it keeps Jesus, the Eucharist, constantly sacrificed. My God was sacrificed once for all. Once for all. Because even when it's celebrated on the humble altar of the country church, the Eucharist is always in some way celebrated on the altar of the world. He's taking it all the way to the world. And he's talking about this bread. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, etc., 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 etc. Does this Pope have an agenda? Yes or no? Of course he has an agenda. And if we don't see it, we are fooling ourselves. We are fooling ourselves. We are called to include in our work a dimension of receptivity, of gratuity, which is quite different from mere inactivity. Rather, it is another way of working which forms part of the very essence. That's why they have the family union, where they're going to say that the Sunday is absolutely necessary for family unity so that everybody can be together. The economy needs it. The environment needs it. you know how much gas you produce? On a Sunday? Pope Francis calls for a new ecological economic order. So here is this Pope making himself very, very plain what he wants to say. Pope Francis wraps up the first leg of his three nation South American pilgrimage Wednesday after issuing an impassioned call for a new economic and ecological world order where the goods of the earth are shared by everyone, not just exploited by the rich. It's interesting that Kissinger said that Obama is the one who can possibly bring in this new world order. The goods of the earth are meant for everyone, and however much someone may parade his property, it has a social mortgage. It doesn't belong to you. You will be disinherited, Francis said, the tapping of natural resources which are so abundant in Ecuador must not be concerned with short-term benefits. Revelation 13.3, and I saw one of his heads as were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, Satan which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with them. And I'm amazed at the Bible. Here's a Sumerian god known as Ninurta, a prototype of Marduk. And Marduk is the one who became the ruler over evil. And even in this depiction, there's the seven-headed beast with one of the heads wounded. Can you see that? And this imagery that was known to the prophets, just as the imagery of the lion with eagle wings was known to the prophets, God had it all in place, and Satan was playing his counterfeit all along. So the god Maduk, 
with the sign of Anu, which is the circle with a cross within a cross, which you will find in the Vatican Square, became the ruler over the people of evil. And that Jesuit priest said that this new world order must be with rules to accommodate evil people because good people are hard to come by and when you do find them, they're impossible to live with. Remember that quote? Now, I'm going to skip this. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye you, see you not these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. We read here in uh, the writings of Ellen White, the ruin of Jerusalem was a symbol of the final ruin that shall overwhelm the world. The prophecies that received a partial fulfillment in the overthrow of Jerusalem have a more direct application to the last days. We are now standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. A crisis is before us, such as the world has never witnessed. And sweetly to us, as to the first disciples, comes the assurance that God's kingdom ruleth over all. The program of coming events is in the hands of our maker. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of his church in his own charge. The divine instructor is saying to every agent in the accomplishment of his plans, as he said to Cyrus, I girded thee, thou hast, though thou hast not known me. With the stoning of Stephen, probation closed for the Jews as a nation. Now I want to draw the typology. When the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar, did probation close for them? No. God is gracious. When did probation close for them? When they stoned Stephen. So, when the Protestant churches say, we have no king but Caesar, the evangelicals are planning in the John 17 movement to be on board with the unity of the churches. The Lutherans have made it public. They're the ones who led the way and they're the ones who are saying we're going back. By doing so, they are saying we have no king but Caesar. That's the typology. When will probation close? When they persecute the antitypical Stephen. Then probation will close. Are they working on Sunday legislation which will lead to persecution of those who do not obey it? Yes or no? Yes. So how close are we to the end? I'm not going to make a year. I'm not going to make a date. I'm just saying the first half will be complete in 2017. That's not very far away. That's not very far away. And then I don't know how quickly they will implement the second part but it must come and then will come the antitypical destruction of Jerusalem and a time of trouble such as never was and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which stands for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. I want you to read Hebrews with me. Hebrews 11. By faith. Ah, what a beautiful word. By faith. Not by paraphernalia. Not by sacramental efficacy. Not by some priest or some host or some relic, but by faith. Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. What's our choice going to be? What's our choice going to be? Are we going to choose the passing pleasures of this world 
when we know prophecy and it is fulfilling before our very eyes? Do you remember the time when we used to say these things lie in the future? And now, out of the same mouth, what a privilege, we can say, they're not in the future, they're here. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Do we want an earthly reward? Or are we looking for a heavenly reward? By faith he forsook Egypt. And I want to say to my Lutheran friends and to my Methodist friends, and I want to say to my evangelical friends all over the world and to my Baptist friends, wake up! You knew the prophecy. You preached the prophecy. You have left the prophecy. You have joined up with what you called Antichrist and you have absorbed their doctrines and if you haven't, you've decided it doesn't make any difference. But I want to tell you, you will be crucifying Christ anew. Come out. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. I want to tell you, you do not have to fear the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Can you imagine what this earthly king will feel like sitting on his white throne with plastic cherubs by his side when the king of kings arrives in his glory and his father's glory and all his angels with him. What will happen to that king? He will be destroyed by the brightness of the coming. Doesn't the Bible say so? So why should we run after a king that would be destroyed? But let's go with him who is invisible. But for that you need faith. You need faith. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and he will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. How many of our brethren are running in ecumenical channels rather than accepting the sure word of prophecy. Did God, in his mercy, give this church the great treasure that he has given her in the prophetic writings so that we should ignore them? I have read the books personally because I like to read what she says. I don't particularly like to read what other people say she wrote. In the same way, I like my Bible to say what God said and not a dynamic equivalent version that tells me what a theologian thinks what God said. I don't need regurgitated information if God gives me direct information. And so I would, I would say, in just a little while, he will not delay. You must live by faith, but you must not shrink back. And if there are any of our brethren who have shrunk back because the message is too confrontational. Come back on board before it is too late. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are standing before the climax of history. The arrogance of the man of sin has no boundaries. And yet the world reveres him as a saint sent from heaven. Please open the eyes of your children that they will not go along with this major error of reuniting with a king that is the epitome of Caesar. Let them not all say we have no king but Caesar, but let them grab hold on the eternal power of the Lord Jesus Christ and may they be saved and stand on the sea of glass and help your people who are supposed to bring this message to wake up so that they can bring this message and that it may be a loud cry and not a whimper. That is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.